Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Suzanne Chin Taylor. Suzanne is the CEO of Creative Raven and the host of the Doo Doo Divas Smells Like Money podcast. Suzanne, welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. Thanks, Spencer. Appreciate you coming on. Oh, I appreciate you asking me. Excellent. Yeah, so our mutual friend, uh, Jeff Fullerton, introduced us. And I, when I found out that there was somebody called the Doo Doo Diva, I was like, I got to meet this lady. And then I started listening to your podcast, and it's really good, and I quite enjoy it. I'm becoming a fan. And so I, I, I just appreciate you making the time. And uh, your, your branding is some of the most amazing, iconic, hilarious you know, stuff I've ever seen. And it's, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> so it's, well, it's a huge well, thank, fan. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, when a number of industry colleagues, it's, it's Suzanne, you interview for all of the publications in the industry. You're a keynote speaker at all of our trade shows. Why don't you have a podcast? You've got so much knowledge. You know so many people. You know how to ask the questions. And I just kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And then finally, I met someone that introduced me to this little podcast agency in the Philippines that cool. said, well, we can take care of that for you for a really reasonable price. And so I was like, well, yeah, I could afford that for marketing. Why not? So I started thinking about a name and like came up with uh, the infotexture talks or, you know, like other, other things really related, like trenchless talks or things like that. And one of my friends years ago had kind of just affectionately nicknamed me in front of a bunch of people at, <laughs> at a trade show. Well, yeah, well, because she's the doo doo. She's the poop diva. And I kind of went, ew. And he says, OK, we, I think we could say that nicely. The, the doo doo diva. And I was like, okay. <laughs> On that, I triple alliteration. I love it. And it just kind of, it just kind of stayed. And so when I started thinking about an interesting name for it, I ran it by a couple marketing friends of mine, and I said, "What do you think about the Doo Doo Diva podcast?" And he said, "We got to take it one step further." I said, "All right." And one of the favorite expressions in our industry, and it, it all came about. Um, I was on a video shoot with one of my techs. And we were the, with a client, and he had never been on a live site near a live store before. <laughs> so we had to film this prep work for this rehabilitation of a manhole. So they had a bypass system going on, and they popped the lid, and he's filming, like the prep work, and he sticks his head over the manhole, and he just reels back. And says, oh, God, that stinks. <laughs> and so my client, the contractor, and I looked at each other, because, you know, we're not noticing anything, maybe because we're too used to it, what they call that <laughs> nose blind. We, we both lean over the manhole and go, you know, give it a good stiff test. And we come up and we look at each other. And this was not planned. It was not scripted. I swear to you, it was not scripted. On cue, in sync, we said, smells like money to me. <laughs> that's awesome. And that's an old expression in our industry that when people go, ooh, you work in this, hey, that brown stuff turns to green stuff. I don't care. I like it that. Smells <laughs> to me. And I just felt that it would be like the perfect thing. I launched it in the middle of COVID when we were all so stressed. And, you know, humor was at an all time low. And I figured, you know what? If we can't laugh at ourselves, because let's face it, we're in the sewer industry. Let's think about what we're dealing with every day. Toilet humor is just rampant in our industry nobody thinks about it we just laugh about it so i figured you know what be irreverent yeah i like if it people don't like it oh well <laughs> but everybody loves it like it's totally non-offensive it's hilarious and i think it really works i mean one of the things i really love about you know the little bit of work i've done so i'm a robotics engineer uh, by trade but uh, i've done work with red zone robotics and obviously i know jeff from edge ai and so um, every time I go into one of those shops, it's the best humor in the world and everybody's making poop jokes. And 
I got, you know, I'm not nose blind because I've not been around it that much. So I remember walking into Red Zone for the first time and just kind of gagging, seeing one of their responders coming back from a mission. You know, and, you know, the VP of engineering at the time, Jason Mazgorski, turns to me. He's like, oh, yep, smells like Washington. You know, like, <laughs> and so I thought that was hilarious. And everybody is like that. You know, I, I noticed like, you know, Edge had a really similar vibe, you know, which is really great. And then you're not the first person I've heard that smells like money uh, joke from. So I, I really like that line, too. I have to imagine that, you know, the, the wastewater treatment industry probably had a sense of humor prior to COVID. I can't imagine this all just arose because of the pandemic. I, I got to imagine you guys were funny to begin with. Oh, yeah, we, we were hilarious. <laughs> it's an industry that they're salt of the earth people. And if you know, because you're a robotics engineer, computer, computer geek, um, you know, the term WYSIWYG, and they truly are WYSIWYGs. What's a WYSIWYG? There's WYSIWYG, what it's, you know, for an edit, a WYSIWYG editor for web development and coding is what you see is what you get. And so they're the, they're just salt of the earth people. And they do have a great sense of humor because we do the dirty jobs that no one else wants to do. They are unsung heroes. And just because I want to, and because I can in this public forum, I want to give a shout out to all of those that work in this field and do the hard work every day, because without them, we would not enjoy the health and lifestyle that we do as a developed nation. Oh, we for just sure. wouldn't. Agreed. And even though our infrastructure is failing and we've got problems and we've got a lot of work to do. I'll tell you, you go and, you know, I have an office in India. You go and you spend some time in a country like India and you come back and I tell you, you will never take for granted the water that comes out of your tap and your toilet ever, ever again. Well, just the fact that toilet water in the U.S. is potable to me is wild. You know, like the, you could drink it. Like, you know, what I mean, that doesn't exist no, many maybe. other places. No, that's true. That is true. I mean, you go to India, you actually if you're coming from the West and you're not born in India, or haven't inherited that, you know, from a parent, you have to brush your teeth with bottled water. You can't even rinse the tooth. You, it's dangerous to rinse your toothbrush and then possibly get it in your mouth. You can get very, very sick. And that's staying at like a four-star hotel. It's just the quality of the water over there. And so it's, I have a great appreciation of what these guys do. Um, took many pictures. If anybody's interested on my website, I have a video about my mission in India. And there were some interesting pictures. I share it with contractors. Yeah. It's, it's a gentleman with a, I guess you would call it like a, an iron chisel and a, and a sledgehammer. And this is how he is breaking apart or off the damaged piece of pipe so they can put in a new one. He is actually sitting in the street on top of the pipe, banging it by hand to take that cast iron pipe apart. And I've given that to people in the industry. I says, listen, next time your employees complain that you're working them too hard, <laughs> look at this picture and say, be thankful for the power tools I give you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's amazing. India, you know, we look at it as a third world country but it has some of the most intelligent oh yeah talented industrious people that you can imagine and there's a will there's a will there are many people that want to make a difference and they've realized that if they wait for their government to do something it's never going to happen and so there are many independent grassroots movements over there that are trying to make a difference for the community. And I say it at the very end of my video is that India's greatest resource is its people. Absolutely. We tap into that, the whole world wins. In my master's class at Carnegie Mellon, there were more Indian students than Americans. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, yeah, I, and can, I can see that for sure. And they're brilliant. Um, and they're, for the most part, they're kind, they're centered. Um, they have a very different attitude in their priorities of life. 
and for the majority of Indians in their life, their connection to source, the one, that is the number one priority in your life, whether you're Buddhist, Hindu, Jain, Sikh, Christian, Muslim, what, whatever, whatever. It's your connection to source. What is second? What is, the, what is source exactly? And maybe you're not going to. Source, God. Okay, God. got it, got it. The one, the source, the God. Yeah. Okay. Um, by whatever name you decide to call him is your relationship with your high, higher power, if you want to call it that way. Second is making sure that you take care of your family and your close friends. And third is the material. And unfortunately, in the West, we've got those priorities flip-flopped. Because one of the first things I noticed when I came into India, there was just an energy there that I couldn't put my finger on until I asked my assistant and, um, you know, who she, she left us this year, an amazing, amazing soul. And uh, she said, um, and, and she explained to me about this, this shift. And I said, yeah, that would explain a whole lot of you pass people in the street and I, and I'm telling you living living in poverty that I think is even harder than some of the homelessness we see here in the United States and sure. yet they smile and they wave and they say good morning and they find peace with their situation is that I think we need to learn how to be content in an empty room. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that's, We're uh, getting that's, off on a philosophical tangent. No, it's all that right. Was, that's that uh, why that was one of the reasons I think it, that really moved me during COVID to do this podcast was to give back to an industry that has been so very good to me Yeah, and has given me a fabulous career, allowed me to do work that I absolutely love. My job does not feel like a job. I can't wait to get up and get to work in the morning and tell the story of what's going on in our industry. And I want to see our industry thrive. You know, I want to see the people in our industry thrive because like I said, they are, they're my superheroes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, to be honest, I, I think that exists across a lot of different industries. Like I, I don't know if you've seen Jake Hull's posts on LinkedIn, um, but he goes by the manufacturing millennial and he he's trying to say very similar messaging about manufacturing. And I agree with him and I agree with yours. And I think that there's people that are doing amazing stuff in, in so many different parts of the world that you just don't get to see every day because you like you said, they're unsung. You know, they, nobody really talks about it or elevates them. And, and that's one of the things I really liked about when I was watching some of your podcast was just getting to kind of see, you know, different people's stories and kind of where they're coming from. And one of the things I like about your format is that I'm actually, I want to ask you about this because I'm curious, like the level of prep required, but it seems like you really package it and there's a lot of thought given to creating actionable advice, you know, on the tail end. Whereas like collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a lot more like philosophical and biographical. So do you have to do a lot of consideration going into one of those and scripting to, to get that, sort of uh, out, output out of it? Or like, how do you how do you achieve that? Well, actually, our step is I reach out to people on LinkedIn that are within the industry who I think could be an interesting guest or, you know, through my digital marketing and trying to get business for my marketing business. Sometimes someone isn't a candidate to be a client just because of their position or whatever, but they're doing something really, really interesting in the field. So I'll say, you know what? I don't believe in letting anybody, you know, who's given me their time to leave empty handed. How about you come on my podcast? Because you seem to know a lot about X, Y, or Z. And we come up with a topic or topics because sometimes I'll do a series of things if someone has got a tremendous amount of knowledge to share, or it seems like one topic is a great segue into another and make a series of it. And so because I've just been doing this for so long and writing and being a journalist in the industry for so long, it's, I know what the industry is going to want to hear about or what I really want to educate the industry about. I don't want the podcast to become a giant infomercial for a technology provider. I want it to be useful, thoughtful, relevant information. And so after we talk about it and I get to know them for about 15, 20 minutes, then I go off and I come up with about three to four 
probing questions. And you know my interview style and, yeah. and how I do. You know, like I'm asking the question and then I let him run with it. And I'm listening very carefully because often we will go, go way off script. Now, I never send the questions in advance. Oh, that's interesting. I do not. We know our topic. We know we're, what we're going to be talking about because I never want it to come off feeling scripted. I want it to be just like you and I are here. I said, I want you to look at this like we're meeting in a Starbucks or your local coffee shop. And we're just talking about, like, for instance, I did a, an episode on nanobubbles. So what's this thing about nanobubbles? Like, <laughs> what, what's the deal? And then just let them run with it. Yeah. Now, I may have the next question coming up. But if they say something where there's a really juicy nugget in there, I have no problem going off my script. They don't know what my script is, but going off my script and allowing the conversation to go down the rabbit hole. Oh, that's just awesome. That's when I find I get some of the most insightful, useful information for the audience. And I learned how to do this when I'm interviewing people for profiles or case studies for the publications that I write for, for the industry, is that someone's talking about something very technical and they'll mention something. I wasn't going to ask a question about that. All of a sudden it's like, well, tell me about that. Like, what actually happened on that? What did you do to, you know, and just let them run with it. And sometimes, like I said, that gets me some of the most interesting stuff to add into a story that people are going to be like, oh, wow, that's cool. Or if I hear something that they mention that I know that I've been talking to somebody else about that they're saying, yeah, we're struggling with this or this has been a problem for us. And this guy's just talked about a solution to that. I want to expand on that because there's somebody out there that's waiting for that answer. And so it's just through the interviewing process of being willing to not get so hung up on staying on the script. Yeah, yeah. I can respect that a lot. It honestly sounds like our interview styles are more alike than different because uh, yeah. like you, I mean, I'll, I'll come in with a basic list of questions like, you know, how'd you get into this? What makes you, you know, go to work every day? You know, what gets you out of bed in the morning? What are some of the cool things you're working on? But then, I mean, I if I hear an interesting tangent or I see it coming, I kind of lean into it. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's I think I end up with longer form content than you. So I thought maybe you had more scripting that kind of manicured that in. But it sounds like you do the same thing. But if yours go along, you'll just roll it into another episode, which I, I think right. is Right, that's neat. what we decided to do, that if if it feels like, there's so much to that subject matter that needs to be covered. I'll opt to do multiple episodes because I know in our industry, or at least with my audience, after that 20, 25 minutes of like a technical podcast, you start to lose them. They want to listen to it on the commute in yep. or on their lunch break, you know, when they're catching up. And if I can give them that little, I call them dopamine drips. You know, <laughs> I give them a little snippet, then they're going to, okay, so stay tuned. Next time we're going to continue our conversation that is what is going to make them want to come back because they're, I want to hear what that guy has to say on this subject. And so when you're doing that, for me, I find it's important to tease it. It's the same way when I'm writing digital content for social media. If it's a long form subject, you don't have to do an 1800 word blog post, break it into three sections and keep them hungry for more. Oh, that's interesting. All Leave them wanting more. Because those are consumable in like a single setting, basically. But if you were to say it all at once, people would just say, oh, well, I'll get to it never. <laughs> and, you know. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, um, Americans do not like to read a lot. You know, we're so busy. We're getting pummeled with just information all day long. And our brains are overloaded. We want like the Cliff Notes version of War and Peace. Yeah. We don't want to have to sit and read that long novel just tell me the basic principles how's it going to benefit me and do i want to pursue this and get more yeah it makes sense and a lot of times when i'm thinking about questions on a podcast i'm trying to sit in the listener's seat as i'm doing the interview and think about they're probably saying to themselves okay i'm going to give this 20 to 30 minutes of my time so what's in it for me 
And really, at the end of the day, that's all someone is thinking about. If they're going to sit across the table from you in a sales meeting or listen to a podcast, they're thinking, what am I going to get out of this? What is the benefit of me giving you my time? Because my time is valuable. That's pretty insightful. And I will say, like, when I listened, I listened to the episode you did. Um, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he was doing fraud prevention and also forensics after the fact. Yes, so, that was probably one of my favorite episodes. He was so John good. Todd. He he was an amazing <laughs> interview. Oh, he was awesome. The fact that he shoehorned a magic trick into it with a three card money piece, I thought was incredible. I, like it yes. was, it was just so tight. And I, I was like, how did you, you know, that's, that must've been scripted. Like it's just, you know, it, it flowed so beautifully. And so I, I just figured, you know, like that's, it's neat to know that that just kind of happened organically and, you know, with a little bit of prep, but it sounds like, you know, prep plus finesse and adaptivity in the moment. So that's, that's a really cool format. Oh yes. And, and that interview, that was one of those that was so much shock value to it that, you know, when he told me about the percentages for utilities, was and it 5%? The top, uh, the top five yeah. that victims of, uh, you know, big levels of fraud. It, I was shocked. It was 5% I, of all commerce, he said, was, was, was fraud, right? And I've only ever been a victim of that kind of fraud once. And I mean, it really gripped me that episode because I was like, oh, wow, I could have prevented this. You know, like there's all these different things you can do. And like I, I added the guy's number to my phone at the end of the episode. And the follow-up one called Payday Pickpockets about payroll fraud, which is one of, the easiest frauds, one of the easiest frauds, that, that was this week's episode, um, one of the easiest frauds to commit, that was mind-blowing too. I can't wait to give it a listen. Oh, yeah. He was fun. He was he was a lot of fun. Yeah, for sure. No, he, he – I feel like with that industry, like you think you're going to, and this is me stereotyping and, you know, being a schmuck or whatever, but I mean, the, okay. I think the preconceptions, like you're going to get someone draconian and boring. And that guy was not that at all. Like he was engaged, intelligent, and um, just, you know, highly interesting to listen to him talk. So I, I really, he seemed like, like a puzzle addict a little bit, you know, like somebody that just liked getting himself in the mindset of the people he's, he's kind of going after. And so I thought oh, that yeah. was that was interesting to hear how that guy thought. There's another uh, series that I did with a gentleman out of uh, Texas um, about manholes and I and I, and he was just I mean, just if you're interested in it, you know, a couple what of is I and about, I uh, about I and I, you know, inflow and infiltration. Oh, got it. Okay. Holes. Yep. Yeah. And uh, he was he was funny. He was funny. He was a a Texan in every true sense of the word, you know, with the drawl and just, he was just, he was animated and he was so passionate about the subject matter. You couldn't help but get sucked into the episode. That's Whether awesome. you were interested in manhole rehabs and leakage, it didn't <laughs> matter. He was just so interesting to listen to. And, you know, sometimes it's very difficult to find guests that, They've got something very important to share, but making it interesting. For sure. Yeah. And that sometimes that's one of the challenges Like we're talking about. Um, oh, gosh, it's coming up. Parasitic acid. Like, or, you know. What is that? Or it's, it's a chemical that is used for um, disinfection in wastewater treatment. Has some other capabilities as well. But um, just doing a different spin on that and taking something that would be typically a very dry subject matter and finding a way to shed a new light on it or make people look at something a different way. Yeah. And that's what I try to do is put a different spin on something that they may have heard of before, but let's come at it from a different direction. For sure. How can we do it better? Because we're really, we're losing a lot of our labor force in this industry. And so one of the missions that I've had in trying to bring a lot of people onto the show of late is bringing ideas of how we can increase young people or people that are in a career and they're not happy, they're looking to do something different, 
to bring them into this industry and to see it as an industry that is so full of so many amazing opportunities. You know, when we think about what, it's not this dirty, icky job that everyone has this preconceived notion about. It's not at all. And I would say to anybody that may be interested in it, call your local wastewater treatment plant, find out if they have an education day or community day and ask if you could have a tour of the plant and see what it's really like to be an operator in a wastewater or water facility and all the different facets of being involved in that. You could work in the lab, you could be out in field, you could be testing, you could be sampling. You could, there are so many opportunities. And I tell parents, you know what? Not everybody is meant to go to college and not everybody wants to be saddled with hundreds of thousands of debt, dollars of debt when they get out and guess what, mom and dad, they're going to be living with you till they're 45. Okay. So here, I'm going to give you something. There are opportunities in wastewater treatment that can open doors that guess what your son or your daughter is not going to have after they get their class operator certificates and work their way up. College debt. They're going to get their education paid for. And at the end of their certification, when you become a top tier operator, you've got the equivalent of a master's degree in you know microbiology or biochemistry. Even if you don't want to stay in a government entity, you can go work in private sector for industrial wastewater treatment. A lot of people don't understand that there is a tremendous opportunity that it's not just municipal working with sanitary stuff that comes out of us, but there is wastewater treatment for food processing, for beverage, for bakeries. It's, it's a huge field and the sky is the limit. And you can make a really, really good living wage. And so for me, yeah, I'm on my bandwagon because I need to see more people. I want to see more young people consider this as a career because it's exciting. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and I mean, honestly, like I'm very content in my job. I, I love building robots and, and going into all these interesting environments. But when you said you can go to your local municipality and check out a wastewater treatment facility, in my head, I was thinking, I want to do that. <laughs> so, I, I tell everybody, everybody to do it or, or the water treatment facility and, uh, you know, see what they do every day. Now, during COVID, a lot of them shut down, you know, their tours for obvious reasons. Um, but now they're starting to open up the community events where they do that. Uh, some communities will actually do like an open house for the community that you live in. So they give you a tour of the plan and they have some, you know, refreshments and, you know, ask questions and they have things for the kids to understand it. And it's just a great opportunity, I think, for anybody to learn about what goes on in their community and, you know, what happens? Like, what did it actually take when you turn on that tap to have that water come out? That when you flush that toilet, where does that go? What happens? <laughs> it after it leaves your house oh i've seen the camera then, feeds from the robots <laughs> yeah well yeah you know and just because it's out of sight doesn't mean it should be out of mind yeah that's awesome well and one of my favorite things um when i'm visiting a uh, robotic sewer inspection company is people love to show you the stuff they found in the sewer on the camera oh, and the yeah. lidar feeds like my one friend was showing me um, a scan that he did dropping down into a manhole. And it was really interesting, the shape, because it got wider and then it went out. And then, um, you know, he said, you see all that stuff? Those are all cockroaches. You know, I'm like, oh, wow, that's a lot of cockroaches. And then somebody else was showing me at, at a different facility, you know, like the camera footage of a robot going down a pipe. Like that's human feces, that's human feces, that's human feces. And, you know, every I think everyone's kind of a 12 year old at heart. So I'm giggling like a little kid while he's telling me this. You know, <laughs> It just seems like a blast. Uh, one of my favorite technicians at a manufacturing facility I used to work for. I tried to get him to work for a sewer inspection company. I'd be like, dude, you've already got the sense of humor. Like, you'll love these guys. <laughs> Send him your resume. And he was a little slow on sending the resume. So we ended up not working there. But I, I, I wanted to try to get that guy into that industry because from the little glimpse I've gotten, it just seems like a beautiful culture. And, and like you said, I mean, we wouldn't have civilization without sewage and sewage removal. And so it's, it's 
one of the cornerstones of our society, as you put it. Right. Well, you see this guy behind me, uh, my Gandhi G, and everybody is know, you know, so familiar with that, you know, the, the famous quote, you know, be the change you wish to see in the world. But there's another quote, and a lot of people aren't aware of it, that he said, sanitation is just as important, if not more so, than freedom. Interesting. I is that not, not that. deep? Because yeah. if you think about it, without sanitation, we have poor health and disease. And without our health, we have nothing. How can you be free if you're sick? Yeah. It was a real, you know, a great, great observation. Absolutely great observation. Oh, by the way, when you said about all the cockroaches, people yeah. in the industry will laugh. When you see a lot of cockroaches in a manhole or in the sewer system, that's actually a good sign. That means that there's a lot of healthy air and oxygen in the system and not toxic H2S gas because they can't live where there's H2S. So oh, that's interesting. You see the cockroaches that's, or mice. That's really interesting. I, I did not even think of it that way, but now I will next time I see cockroaches. Yeah. I think one of the most interesting tapes that I ever saw was out in the desert because I got my start in the industry with a camera manufacturer based in Thousand Palms, California. And we were doing a, a demo run in this one area of the desert and we encountered an endangered kangaroo rat, kangaroo which is rat. really like a little mouse. It, it carries its babies in a pouch <laughs> and it, it, its paws are, you know, like up like this. That's and adorable. It's got really long like the way it sits it's got really long legs like a you know where how kangaroos have that the long extension of the feet how they sit and it sits like that that's and, awesome and, and yeah it was really really cool we filmed him and we just sat there with the camera and he didn't flinch he just sat there and ate and he groomed himself and he probably liked the warmth of the lights <laughs> like, sorry you know he's probably enjoying it and, and our camera operator ray he just sat there and said, I'm just going to leave the camera and we'll just see how long he stays. And he stayed there for probably a good 15 to 20 minutes. That's wild. That's awesome. Yeah. It was just fun. You know, it's like mother nature. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I love those moments like in the park where you're, you're hanging out and in, in Pittsburgh, we've got a lot of deer and sometimes I think they're used to people feeding them. Cause you can get maybe like five, 10 feet away and they'll just hang out and, the other day I was in a family of about five of them. And I remember just, you know, like, oh, this is awesome. I'm just going to be as quiet as possible and crouch down low and see how long I can hang out with these guys before they decide I'm a threat and run away. And so I got five minutes, not nearly as long as the 15, 20 with the kangaroo rat. So oh, okay. you'd mentioned opening an office in India, and I'm kind of curious about uh, kind of what motivated that and what the journey has been like getting spun up there? Because I know international business can be daunting for a lot of people, and it sounds like you've got some deeper reasons as well. Well, it all started in 2006, and I can't remember his name, but I interviewed a gentleman, and he was from Ohio, and it was for an article that I was writing about his city, profiling it for Municipal Sewer and Water Magazine. And he told me about this book by Rose George entitled The Big Necessary. And he says, you got to read this. You know, as much as you're into this, you're going to enjoy it. And so I went out and I got the book on Amazon and bought it and read it. I couldn't put it down. And that book changed my life. It was all about the world of human waste and how it is dealt with around the world in, you know, countries, you know, un you know underdeveloped countries. And a large focus was on India and India's problems and what some private people are trying to do. And just something hit me that someday I'm going to do something to go there and try to make a difference. So fast forward 10 years, 2015, um, my husband, 23 years, uh, he had been ill for a long time, but took a very sudden turn for the work, worst and passed. Sorry and it, yeah, now it, it's it's all good. It was it was a it was a great relationship. We had a great run. He was quite a few years older than I was. You know, I knew we were on borrowed time. 
but we made the most of it. And so about a year later, um, I was trying to figure out, okay, so what does Suzanne want to do with the rest of her life? You know, what's my new normal? And so I reached out to a friend that I had known in the United States that had helped me with a lot of networking and resourcing. He was an international, international marketer. He was from India, came here to the States, became a citizen, lived here for many years. And I reached out to him and I said, you, you know, I've always had this thought in the back of my mind of doing something, but because my husband was ill, I really couldn't do much because I needed to be the caregiver. And I said, but now I'm in a situation where I have time and I would like to pursue this dream and I need help. And he said, it would be my honor to bring you into country and introduce you to some people and see how we can do this. Also, because there's so many talented people in India, even for your marketing business for the States, you might be able to help more companies because you'll be able to bring creative services to them at a much lower cost while still not sacrificing the quality for what they need. Cool. And I said, okay. So I traveled to Bangalore. I made this video that's on my website, Win Windows of Opportunity. I'd always loved the country. So just to take a little a back um, flashback, I'd said earlier, you know, all of my babysitters were my father's graduate students from India. <laughs> and so I grew up fascinated because he knew instead of the teenage neighborhood girl, these were older students. And so they were going to make sure that little Suzanne went to bed on time. <laughs> did her homework, brushed her teeth, and, you know, did what she was told. And they were so magical to me because they'd come in their salwar kameez or they'd be dressed in their sari and they'd have their makeup and they'd have their Bali earrings and their bracelets. And, and just to me, they were just this wave of color and magic. And I would ask them about their country and start to learn things. And I just became enamored with it. Um just because of the principles behind it. And I learned about Gandhi at that time and his mission. I did a third grade book report. It says, write a book report about someone important in history that you admire. Everybody else is doing Jefferson, Washington, <laughs> and the you know, uh, current president. Who do I do my book report on? Gandhi. Gandhi. Got an A plus on it. Nice. And, uh, the nun thought it was pretty interesting, like, why Gandhi? And I said, just because of what he what he stands for. And that one person can make a difference in the world. So going back um, in India, just fell in love with the country. And it's kind of like my second heart home. You know how we always say we have a heart home? My heart home has always been the desert. You know, I love where I live. I'm in northern Arizona, right at the foot of the Mingus Mountains and the Red Rocks. Um, oh, cool. But India, India is just a special ancient country. And the people are just, the people are amazing. The music is amazing. The, the art, the artistry is just, it's, it's mind blowing. And going over there and seeing the problems and saying, I want to make a difference. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do this. So I decided, I'm going to open an office here. I'm going to establish a footprint and I'm going to start casting the net. And I'm going to look for people who want to join in on this journey with me, who've got technology that want to come into India and make a difference by don't look at money because a lot of Western companies, especially in this wastewater space have gone into India and they have really done India a great disservice. One thing you have to understand about India is that you still have that, that very, you don't want to think about it. We try to not think it's it's so strict, but it's still, the caste system is very prevalent. It's not going to go away anytime soon. It's not going to go away in my lifetime, I'm sure of it. It's been embedded for thousands of years. Brutal. That it's, it, it's brutal. And so the folks that are allowed to handle human waste are the lowest of the lowest castes. And they're the least educated of the population. So... When you come in and you put in a centralized wastewater treatment plant that is kind of like you would see in the United States and you get it up and running and it's great. But here's a little known fact. 
of the centralized wastewater treatment plants in India are essentially inoperable. I mean, they operate, they're on, the lights are on, the water comes in, things go through a bar screen, the rags and the debris are taken. But that water pretty much goes out to the receiving waters, not too different than the way it came in. Huh. 73%, you said. Are inoperable. That's wild. We're, we're not operating at what, how they 27% should. kind of work. <laughs> kind of work, okay? Because the mechanics and the knowledge needed to run a plant of that complexity, you need engineers, you need class A wastewater operators. You're not going to get that with a gentleman who, if he's lucky, has a third grade education and can barely read and write. So if there's going to be a change, either people have to come in from the outside and pony up and work shoulder to shoulder with the people that under that cultural system are allowed to do this work and train them through pictures, through verbal, for through video, and work with them in their language and train them how to operate. Or it has to be contracted, where people from the West have to come in and come in and do that work. Or we have to develop simpler, easier to operate technology that is efficient, that is solar, that is sustainable, has fewer moving parts, will do what it needs to do, but can be managed by the people who are going to manage it effectively to keep it up and running. So in understanding that, it's you can't go into a country like India thinking, oh, I'm going to make a million dollars. You will eventually. Yeah. But you have to go in with the attitude that I will do well by doing good. And there are a number of companies in India that was a great project. It was a, a private firm, very big, big company, like what we would consider like a Fortune 100 company in the United States. In cooperation with community activists and technology providers and their town where the factory was and where most of their workers lived, came together to clean up a water body that was a drinking water source that raw sewage was going into uh. and together. And it was a, I don't know how many year program it was, but the government wasn't involved, but community, different leaders of the community came together to design this, to figure out a solution. And now it's like a model for what can be done. Much like we think about these P3 projects in the United States, you know, private, it was a private, private partnerships. I don't know about this yet, but um, like I'm listening. P3, it's like you get public, uh, private funding for public projects. Oh, interesting. And you form a partnership. And so it was kind of like that where you had public private partnership, probably. Yeah. Where you had uh, a, you have the public community working in tandem with a private and entity, you know, private sector entity who wanted to get behind it because they knew if I improve my community, my workers are going to be happier. I'm going to be able to recruit people to come and want to work at my company because the surrounding environment, that this is a community that's great to live in. And then my company's going to thrive. Yeah. So it's kind of looking at it that way. Is that coming at it from another angle? And so I'm just seeing all these opportunities in India. And so I'm throwing this out because I have someone that I'm working with that has got the inroads and has been awarded some projects. And we are trying to make a difference. And he wants me involved just because my passion, bringing people together, becoming a liaison, being a spokesperson for this here and there. But we are looking for companies that are interested in coming on this journey with us. In particular, folks that are in decentralized wastewater treatment plant development. Interesting. That are, that are not afraid to come into India with us, intellectual property, joint venture. That's the other thing is if you are going to enter India, you need to make sure that you have got a partner to work with boots on the ground that is local, that has all the channels, 
has all the relationships because business is done in India through relationships. And yes, there is corruption. The only difference between their corruption and our corruption, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just going to say this. And, nah, you and should you, be blunt. You can, you can add this out. I'm going to be very blunt. Yeah. They are very open and overt about it, where we are very backdoor deal, covert about it. We have to do things differently. We have to understand that they wear it out on their sleeve. And so if you know that going in, if that bothers you, well, then don't come into India. <laughs> but if that going in, no, if it bothers you, you can't deal with it. Okay. But if you understand the dynamics and you understand that's part of the culture and okay, that's what it's going to take to play the game. That's what's going to take. I have to work with certain people. I have to have boots on the ground and it's not, it's not going to be an instant sale. It's going to take years of planting seeds and developing relationships. They're very, very, they want technology from the West, but they're very distrustful of it. And for good reason. <laughs> Look at their history. You're talking about the British. Look at what the British did to them. Yeah. It was one of the richest nations in the world. Gold, diamonds, um, natural resources, incredible wildlife, ancient healing Ayurvedic medicine. It was, it was a treasure trove. It was a treasure trove. And look at it now. So you can understand why there is great distrust because and some of these projects that have come in for the West for infrastructure, for wastewater treatment, where these plants get built, everything looks great. It looks like it's pie in the sky. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then six months later, the plant starts to fail and they can't get it back up running and they don't have the help they need. Because again, getting back to who's running the plant. Yeah. And so we in this industry have to understand the environment we're going into, that whether it's India or any country, any third world country that we're going into, we have to think about who is going to be manning the store Who's going to be driving the truck after we leave, after we set it up, train them, drop the goods off and go home back to our little comfortable home in the United States or Europe or whatever? Who's going to be responsible? And so, yeah, we want to make money by bringing our technology into these places because we know it can help. But if it's destined to fail because of the environment and the community and the people that are going to be responsible for it, going in, then we're not the right solution. So maybe we need to look at trying and trying instead of trying to convince them that we've got what they need, why don't we look at what they need and then build the solution to fit the need? Yeah, that's the best way to solve any problem. And maybe it won't make as much money, but guess what? It's a country with a lot, a lot of people so you sell one, it might not be that profitable, but let me tell you, you're going to make it up in volume. And eventually you will make money because you'll find ways to establish manufacturing there and bring jobs in. And you'll basically create your own little economic ecosystem. And again, it all gets back to doing well by doing good. And so for me, I'm looking for companies that can see enough of what I see. And maybe want to join this, jump on this ride with me. Yeah. Is there, what would be the best action for somebody listening to be able to take if they're interested in getting involved? Just, just get in touch with me. Just get in touch with me. Let me know what you've got, you know, where you'd like to help, what you would see, what's going to be involved. And we'll have a conversation and see if it's a good fit. Um, we'll get different partners involved in the conversation and, it's we're not going to let you go in blind and we're not going to let you go in thinking this is all rainbows and unicorns and you're going to make a million dollars overnight. We're going to tell you the reality of it. And if, if you've got, if you got the wherewithal for it, this is not for the faint of heart, but if you're really committed to making a difference in the world, this is one place where you can really start and truly, truly make a difference. Yeah, that's but beautiful. It's going to take tenacity and it's going to take patience 
And come on, I've been at this. I've been at this since 2017, working at it, planting the seeds. Now I've got a great team. I've got a fantastic team of creatives over there that can do lots and lots of work, you know, on the website and on the, you know, those marketing services for the West. But at the same time, I want to bring the West to India. But I knew that wasn't going to happen overnight. It was going to take me years to find those channels. And we're on, we're finally on the brink of it. That's awesome. So now is the time. If you've been thinking about it, now is the time. That's really cool. And what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? if they? Because I, I really do want this to be actionable for someone listening. Yes. Um, again, Suzanne Chin Taylor. My telephone number is 760-217-8010. You can email me at raven at creativeraven.com. And you can also visit our website, which is Creative Raven. And I would encourage anybody watch the video that we have on the homepage of our website about the comp my mission and our company's mission into India to kind of get really a feel for who we are and what we're trying to do. And if that's something that if you're in alignment with that and you see that and say, yeah, yeah, I like that. Let's have a conversation and see where it goes. That's awesome, Suzanne. Well, I think that's a beautiful place to end if, if that's cool with you. Um, yes. Anything else you want to plug? Or I feel like we did a good job of it, but just in case. Well, the only other thing I would say is that for those who are in this space, that if you need help, one of our one of our things is I'm all about giving back to the industry. So the podcast is free for you to come on as a guest. The second thing is, is if you've done something interesting, I'm a journalist for three or four of the big industry publications. And I may be able to get you some free PR if you've got something interesting that you've been working on as far as a project or you're a city and you, you're doing something very, very proactive. And the third thing is commercially is we are digital content create, creation, you know, for this industry, just for the wastewater industry. So whether you could do some of it yourself and you need, you've got good ideas, but you need somebody to help you execute it, or you're just like, you know what? I don't have the time. I don't want to know. Here's Suzanne. Just do it for me. <laughs> we can do that. And then we have a training arm called the To It Group, which kind of came and grew out of Creative Raven because I saw that to me, everyone is a member of the marketing team in an organization. And so there's a need for workforce development and workplace culture development, especially in our industry, because we're losing so many people. And we need to create a great workforce, you know, workplace culture to encourage, as I said earlier, for people to come in, whether it's private sector working for contractors or manufacturers or on a city level. So we just launched a new course and it's called the Gain, Train, Retain Playbook. And it is nice. how to hire, train and retain the right talent for your business, because a lot of folks, we've got a strange labor pool that we draw from in our industry. It's, <laughs> it's a challenging one, okay? And so we're really imparting knowledge about how to interview well, how to recruit, how to make a good hire. And then if you recognize that, ooh, I may have made a mistake, okay, cut your losses and start that process all over again. <laughs> How to properly train so people don't make mistakes and cost you money or cost you costly repairs because they're not taking care of your equipment well in the field. And then lastly, you get a stellar employee. How do you create an environment where people want to stay Yeah. and people want to get like-minded people like them to want to come and work for your company when there's an opening? And so the course has been put together by myself and a seasoned veteran in the industry who he had employees working for him for 10 or 15 years. People came. Nobody does that anymore. <laughs> and, and nobody, but these people did because he created an amazing environment of opportunity that people just wanted to come to work every day. And so he's sharing, you know, his mistakes of hard knocks and, and things that worked. And um, we're launching that in a live on uh, July 19th. And so people can find out more information about that on the Tuit group. I'm also an everything disc facilitator. So if you're struggling in your organization with, let's say, 
you got a revolving door on the HR department where you're losing people and they're dropping like flies. It might be that you need to create some more trust in your organization. And we help organizations by using everything DISC, uh, facilitation and profile assessments, how to build cohesive teams. And by understanding yourself first, then you're better able to understand others and bridge communication and work better together as a cohesive team. And that's been a very rewarding thing for me because I think the reason that I've stayed in this industry is not because of the products, not because of the work, not because of it's cool, because it is robotics. I love, I see, I started in the robot, bot, robotics field. And so you and I are oh, cool. the same, same look in the same heart. I love the robotics. I, I yeah, likewise, kindred spirits. <laughs> yeah, kindred spirits. But what has made me stay in this industry for all the years that I have, started in 1998, so I've been around a long time, is the people. It's all about the people, and it's always been about the people. And it, I just, I can't say enough about this industry. It's just been so good to me. Um, I had a dear mentor that I met in an airport that he has since passed. Um, great, great friend, longtime person in the industry. But the industry is full of people like that. And for anybody in, you know, listening that is from the industry, if you're struggling with something, reach out to your fellow industry pros. Look for mentors. You will never find an industry that is so full of people that have a true generosity of spirit and want to help those who want to learn. And they will share their knowledge graciously and generously with you. So I had that. I had that gift of so many people that share that with me when I started. And so don't be afraid to reach out. And for those of you who are new that are, oh man, maybe I'm a marketing or business development person in the industry. That's another thing too. I mentor a lot of people in the industry. So reach out to me on LinkedIn. Look at some of the posts on my website. If you've got a question about marketing in this industry and you're struggling, my door is open. I may not be able to talk to you like immediately, but I will make time for you. Because again, I truly believe in paying it forward because you're not able to keep it unless you're willing to give it away. <laughs> That's beautiful, Suzanne. And, you know, to be honest, I know you talk about the wastewater industry and you say that all this is kind of unique to that, but I feel like what you're saying is is true, at least of robotics as well. And some of the other industries I've worked on, I mean, I, I know good mentors have been critical in, in my career trajectory. And I'm fortunate to have lots of people in my life that have mentored me and a few people that I'm starting to mentor as I kind of grow as a professional. And, you know, I mean, I think without that, you know, the whole world is just, you know, we don't learn from our own mistakes, you know, as a society. So no. I, I remember the, the first person that took me on when I finished graduate school said, you know, I just want the next generation. I've made a lot of mistakes in my career and I just want the next generation not to repeat some of them. <laughs> and that was, we've been talking for, you know, mm -hmm. quite a while now, you know, on a pretty regular basis. So I like that. And I kind of, I kind of use that when I take on someone new these days myself, you know, because... It's cyclical. Yeah, that's one of the best lessons we can learn is learning from somebody else's mistakes. And that, that mentor is absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, I really appreciate you coming on. I'm going to cut it. But thanks again. This has been amazing. I really appreciate you. Welcome back anytime. All right. And thank you for having me on. This has been, this has been delightful. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.